Hey, this is Ike Krieger. Welcome to the video version of the Close the Deal Without Selling podcast and in the complete audio version available on your favorite podcast platform, you'll hear me do a complete segment on what is known as imposter syndrome and I think you'll find it very helpful. But right now, let's watch my conversation with sales expert and mentor, Thomas Bloomer. All the listeners of the Close the Deal Without Selling podcast, you're about to meet a man who really has taken over responsibility of becoming an asset to you in the realm of sales and sales leadership. And when I first met Thomas Bloomer, it just made me very happy to find someone else who you know, it's like, it's almost like we're sisters. So uh, <laughs> we're going to have a conversation about selling and sales and leadership and these crazy times that we're in. But first of all, I want to welcome Thomas Bloomer to the Close the Deal Without Selling podcast and say hello. Hi, hello. Um, first of all, I love that opening. I appreciate I, I should probably have you do the opening on my show. I like the way you did that. Um, but I, I am honored to be here and, and to uh, hopefully share some some of that value to your listeners. So I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you very much. And as always, our conversation really will be, uh, I love the term from the 60s, kind of free form and talk about different areas of sales. And I, I believe that you, our listener, uh, is going to go, oh, yeah, I'm dealing with something like that. And that's what this conversation is all about. It's about you and how these talks that we're having can help you be more effective in your quest for success in life. And since we are still, as this conversation is happening in the middle of the COVID uh, reality, uh, a lot of you out there are probably looking at what am I going to do since what I know has just kind of disappeared, or at least you see it off in the distance. And I think that you and I can have a little conversation with this because, first of all, you said that you were, if the term is correct, either downsized and you had to reinvent yourself. And if you don't mind sharing, tell us about the challenges and the successes and the rewards that you have brought to yourself and the people around you for having the courage and the ability to make that shift. All right. Well, reinvent is, is probably the perfect word, I, um, as, as so many people are doing, and, and probably a lot of your listeners today so many of us had to reinvent ourselves this year because there were a lot of curveballs, you know, that were thrown. Um, I, w I was a little bit fortunate in mine. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that, that's a whole other baseball conversation. That's, that's what got me out of baseball. I couldn't hit the curveball. But uh -huh. uh, as we go through life, uh, we, we all have to deal with those. And, and I was uh, a little bit fortunate that, that at least I kind of knew what the pitch was going to be. Um, I, my wife and I knew about two years ago that the company I was with, uh, my time was there, was coming to a close. Um, so we had an opportunity to kind of think ahead and to prepare a little bit. Um, but it still comes as a shock. So, uh, you know, right now I'm sitting there in late March, early April as this pandemic is starting. And, and I'm managing a team of about 90 sale, sellers and sales leaders. And, and we're all approaching something that's brand new. You know, our sellers now, we were a door-to-door -door sale for the most part. They couldn't go door-to-door -door in April. You know, some of their clients were, were locked down. You know, some of their clients were not open for business. A lot of things were changing. So I'm working very close with my team on how to get through that and, and trying to utilize some of what we've learned in the past over different economic changes. And through that, I, I get the call one day as, as, we're, as we're working upper leadership on downsizing and looking for efficiencies. And I get the call and find out, well, I'm going to be one of those efficiencies. So 
um, you know, that uh, about six weeks later, um, you know, my tenure with the company would, would come to a close. Um, but having known it was coming, it still was a shock, but, but then having a few weeks to kind of get prepared and, and say goodbyes to, you know, so many people I'd worked with for a number of years, it gave me a chance to kind of decide what I wanted to do moving forward. And, and that's where I think that that's brotherhood that you and I have really comes into play because we're so passionate about sales. You know, we, we just, this is what we do. I was um, in a podcast workshop uh, the other day and, you know, the, the, the instructor was talking about when you're doing a show, it better be about something you're really passionate about. So a number of the people on were trying to figure out what's their niche, you know, what do they want to talk about on their show? Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, Ike and I, we don't have to worry about that because we get to talk about what we love and, and what we've been doing for, for so many years. So um, so I was excited to say at this point in my career, I, I want to do those things I'm most passionate about and, and I want to help sellers just as you do. I, I want to pass that knowledge on. I think you and I both believe that strong sales behaviors have not changed. How we deliver them, you know, how we develop them if it was 20 years ago, you and I would probably be sitting in a diner, you know, somewhere in, in Jersey, or if I'm on one of my West Coast trips somewhere out in sunny California, and we'd be just sitting there having a cup of coffee, talking sales and things like that. Well, nowadays, we are we can't shake hands. We can't sit at the diner together, but we're meeting virtually. And and in the past, we never would have been able to do that. You and I probably would have never, never crossed paths. So right, how we communicate and how we advance those sales behaviors have changed, but the absolute behaviors have not changed. You know, that's what I think I told you the first time we spoke, um, you know, I'm a big binger. My wife and I love Netflix and, and Prime Video and that. And when we get on a show that we like, we you just, you know, four episodes are gone. Um, the popcorn's gone. The episodes are gone before we knew what happened. It was like that when I first started listening to your show, because it was just like it was like candy for me. You know, I'm going through and enjoying that, and and to me, that's what our sellers are hopefully looking for. They're they're looking for those ideas, how we can help them, and and hopefully you can hear the passion in my voice. That's what I've been doing for the past six months is trying to find ways to to connect with people who are looking for that, who want that advice, who. Uh, they're either a new seller or they're somebody that maybe is struggling. A lot of sellers are struggling through this pandemic, as you opened with. Um, and there's a lot of leaders out there that want to help their people, want to be stronger leaders. And, and they're just looking for some of those best practices and ideas. So uh, that's what I'm hoping we can both do today for everybody. Excellent. So tell me, what is the biggest surprise or the biggest uh, you have received personally in terms of expanding your business um, virtually, you know, you say you want to get in contact with people, you want to let people know. Tell me what your your challenges have been. Well, my biggest challenge was uh, what I, I didn't know what I didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. When we've been doing anything for a long time, I think <laughs> we all get to a point, it's just natural we get a little bit complacent. You know, we think, okay, you know, I, I got this. I kind of know what I'm doing. And, and we're not maybe learning every single day like we need to, or we don't understand some of the things that we really should be paying attention to. So the first reality check for me this summer, and it happened about six weeks after I was out there, I'm building a website for my new business. And, you know, we both know a website's not just going to draw people in, right? I have to draw people to go to the website, but I'm building this website and I'm realizing outside of the people I dealt with, Every day, you know, the, the couple hundred people I'm working with and, and some of the big clients I'm dealing with, outside of that sphere, nobody knows who I am. Mm. Nobody's looking to, to connect with me. Nobody knows what value I could possibly bring to them because I never worried about that for the past 28 years. I focused right. on my people, my clients, and, and my issues. And all of them, they don't need me right now. You know, it's other people that do and they don't know I'm here. So that was kind of an aha moment. I said, OK, if I'm going to be successful, at what I need to do, first thing I need to do is, is do the little things to start showing people, you know, who I am and how I can bring value. And and it goes just back, you know, when I was first on the street selling, uh, I, I worked for an advertising company. So I was in media sales 
And we open up a lot of new markets across the country. Well, when we're opening a new area, they don't know anything about our magazine. Right. I'm going in talking to business owners and they're set in their ways. They have ways of promoting. I'm the new game in town. You know, why, why should I try the new game in town? You know, they would look at me, come come back in a year, show me what yeah. you've done. Tell show me what me you, you show know. Me. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we had to do the little things to, to show them and to build that value. And that's kind of the same thing I'm doing now, just in a more virtual world. So how would you uh, coach a listener to transcend that need for the person to be recognized and move right into the information quality and the information effect on the listener or the user how do you bypass the it, it sounds awfully cold but the hey look at me and what i can do for you into what is it that you need and how do you see this information making the impact because that's the direction i keep trying is you know i i like to be out front and now I'm I'm doing my best to pull back and have the information be out front. What have you found that's helped you do that or has been an obstacle to you doing that? Uh, well, I, I think there's always a lot of obstacles in that. And, and the first one is the fact that um, so often we we want to start telling people about ourselves. You know, that's, that's what we want to do. That's what we've yeah. done. And, and we want to do that. But by the same token, when you're doing it for your company and your features and benefits, that's one thing. When when you're doing it on your own, that's a lot more, you know, I, I'm not comfortable with that. You know, I've never been comfortable telling people about myself or my title or what I've been doing. I'd rather tell them about my company and what we do. Talking about ourselves for many of us is, is difficult. So you have to do that to some extent. People have got to know how to build kind of their personal brand, mm -hmm. which means you do have to, you know, talk about your things and, and the things you're successful with. But you have to learn how to do it and kind of when to do it. And to me, a lot of that is the same thing so many people are doing right now. They're, they're spending time in, in Zoom videos. They're spending time connecting with people on one-to-ones. And to me, the key is the more people you talk to, and you start asking them, you know, what, what are they going through? You know, what's working for them? What are they trying to accomplish? How can I help you? And as you get people to open up and talk, they suddenly start giving you ideas of what you can then share yeah. to yes. them. And, and it's going to be relevant because you're helping to solve a problem that they have. You know, yeah. uh, when I first started doing Zoom videos and one-to-ones, because this type of thing was new to me, I kept a note right next to my computer because I, I had to make sure that I was zeroed in on how can I help you? So as soon as we're starting a conversation, I'm staring at that note card before I even think about, well, this happened to me, that happened to me, this is what I do. So how can I help you? You know, you agreed to this meeting today, why? You know, what are you looking for? How can I be of service to you? Um, and then we start talking and if it's a potential Somewhere along the lines, there's going to be an opening where I need to share them a little bit about how I can be a solution for them. And if I can't, you know, I had a call earlier today. It was a great call, 20 minutes, somebody I really connected with. But there's really no a collaboration there for either of us. But we had a good conversation. And, and who knows, maybe a month from now, they'll meet someone who, who should talk to me or vice versa. So um, I think it, it starts with trying to find out how you can help that other person, asking a lot of questions, and then just kind of seeing where it follows. Both of you trying each other on to see if there's a fit. And there sometimes is not a fit. It's our job as consultants and coaches to be able to look at someone and go, you know, I get what's going on with you right now. And I'm going to refer you to somebody who I believe will be of greater assistance in that area than I might be. And that is one of the beauties of this type of virtual networking, that we're able to find people that we believe in and that we 
trust and that we can say, yeah, well, I'm a ear, nose and throat guy and you have a problem with your foot, go see the specialist down the hall rather than, well, I'm a doctor, so let me work on your foot while you're here. And I'm afraid that many people in our profession have a tendency to, don't worry, I'll do that for you, I'll do that for you. And that, that has a tendency to lower the confidence level that the consumer has in pretty much all of us. So uh, that ability to really find out about your prospect, mwah, excellent. Yep. Uh, we're, we're trying to build trust and respect, right? Yeah, you, know, you, you had told me about how you were working, and I'm shifting a little bit here, into presentations. Um, as you and I have discussed, I believe that a presentation is really an important part of the sales process in the system that I champion. I just put it in a different position in the conversation. I leave it for later on. Mm -hmm. However, many of the, of the listeners, even though they're listening to us and have been listening to me about how to close the deal without selling, still are tied to giving presentations because that's what we were trained to do. We were trained to do show and tell. So when you say you help people with their presentation skills, tell us about that. Well, there's a couple of things I try to work on with people. Um, and especially in sales where it's not always a one call close. So there's some differences. If you're selling a product or service that is a one call type close, that, that can be a little bit of a different presentation. But a lot of sales, you don't close necessarily right after you make that presentation. So, so to me, there's, there's two different elements to the presentation. The first is getting enough good information across and, and covering enough key elements where you're moving the sale along. And I, I think that works in really well with your approach on, on the way you like to do the presentation. I think it's very similar to, to what I would teach. Um, I want to open up and the first thing I want to do is, is to build rapport. I, I think people buy from people that they, they trust, they respect, uh, they like that individual. They, they just kind of feel that, hey, you know what? Um, you know what I used to teach in advertising is a lot of our companies, they had to advertise with somebody. So if they liked me, if they liked me coming out and meeting with them every week, I had a foot up, right? So why not give this one a try? So I, I want to sit down and build a rapport first with a, with a customer and try to see where there's some common ground where we can kind of build that rapport. Um, and to me, you, you talk about probing questions, questions to get a client to open up. Um, I don't know what happens e emotionally or what the chemicals in our body are, but when, when we're talking, we typically get a little more excited and, and we're a little more into it than when we're passively just sitting there listening to someone else talk. So, uh -huh. you know, I used to try to teach if, if you have a presentation and you did 70% of the talking, there's a 70% chance they're not buying from you that day. But if you get them to do 70% of the talking, there's a 70% chance they may be buying from you today. Yeah. So you really want to get them talking and, and having some of those probing questions to get that done. And, and then once I build the rapport through probing, then I have to kind of find out what is the pain point? You know, why did they agree to the presentation? You know, what, what is it that they really need help with? If I try to, you know, give a solution, and I've seen sellers do this so many times over the years, mm -hmm. they go in and they're, they're trying to solve the problem b before they know what it is, right? Describe be before you diagnose. Yeah, and, and, and you can't do that. And, and so it, even if you're right, even if I have the right diagnosis, it's so much more impactful when the business owner that I'm talking to or decision maker, when they verbalize that hmm. pain point to me, because hmm. now they're open and they're invested in it. And so, so I want to go from my probing in building rapport to now my probing is trying to let's, let's find out what the problem is. Let's find out why they gave me time. And, and I can't spend an hour on these things because at some point they're going to get interrupted or they're going to lose patience. So you have to do them, you have to cover them, you have to be thoughtful, but you have to kind of move it along at a, at a good pace. And, and then I need to start giving them some potential solutions, you know, showing them how I can be a solution for that. 
And, uh, you know, one of the things that really works in media sales, one of the things I loved is, is kind of feel felt found. And, and I'm sure you've worked with that in some form over the years. And, you know, when they start showing me, hey, this is my problem. This is my pain point. You know what? I, I've worked with other businesses that feel that they have that same issue. And, and this is what they felt. This is what their problem was. Let me show you how I've helped them. And then when I can show it in, in, in my business, I always wanted to show things visually because so many people learn more visually than they do by just listening. So sometimes the visual is the body language and the passion and the enthusiasm we bring in. But if your product or service also has some nice visuals to show, which, which ours did, we were direct mail beautiful ads that we would do for businesses, you know, I wanted to get those out there and, and, and see what they liked and get them excited about it. There are three things that you have peaked. First is when you say it, it's selling. When they say it, it's true. Goes back to what you were talking with the 70-30, because if you can get them talking and explaining why they believe your product might be able to to take care of uh, whatever issue or problem they're facing. And they say it, they go, hmm. When you say it, they go, hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's so important to ask questions that allow the prospect to tell you why they believe you need that. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, that's where I believe the presentation comes in. After you found out what their needs are, you give them only that presentation and only that information, which proves to them that you can solve their problem rather than all that extraneous information that most people give when they, you know, walk right in. They don't want to know when my company was founded and, and yeah, the, who the principal owners were. Know, if they want to know, they'll ask. Yeah. And, you know, they'll go, well, how long have you been in business? And I always like to say, you know, that's an interesting question of all of the questions you could have asked me right now, what prompted you to ask that one? And find out their reason for asking, because a lot of times we assume that we know the reason they're asking, and we're usually off. And in terms of your doggedness in the nicest of ways of being able to go back and back and back, I'm reminded of a story that I heard years ago about a salesperson who had, it was a B2B and he would go to this office and they say, no, we're with XYZ company and there is never, never going to be an opportunity for you to do business with us. And he goes, I got it, but I need a favor from you. Would you please put your initials and the date on this three by five card? So I can have a record of my being here. And they did it. And he did this week after week after week until he became known as the three by five card man. And then one day he got a call saying we were all so, you know, uh, appreciative of your uh, bulldoggedness that We'd, we'd like you to come in and have a conversation. That doesn't work for everybody, but there it is that if you can be a little self-effacing and a little real, a little authentic, that is, I think, a really important key. And that's a big change from, let me tell you what I can do for you. That, that whole Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross approach was just so, such a challenge for me because it is good at, as good at it as I was, I didn't like it. And that's one of the reasons I, you know, came up with uh, what I'm doing now. Um, you dealt with sales reps, and I know that I get notes from listeners about the leadership factor that's involved in having people sell for you, for your company, and sell in a certain way. What what was the biggest challenge that you came up against when uh, you had a sales team that you were leading, and how did you deal with it? Well, for for the last probably twenty years, um, I worked with both sellers and sales leaders, 
and there there were major obstacles. And, and I, I think you bring up a good point because what happens is a lot of our sales leaders, they become a sales leader because they were a really good seller. They were really good and they, they wanted to grow and they move into a, a management a leadership position. But, but what made them successful is not necessarily what's going to make Mike and Mary and John successful. So some leaders come in and they can kind of have a chameleon approach and, and they can work and, and grow with all different types of people. Some leaders come in and they know one way of doing it. You know, let's go back to the Glen Gary, Glen Ross approach, right? If somebody, if that worked for somebody and you and I have both probably worked with people that, you know, what, what do they, they say you could sell ice to an Eskimo. Yeah. We've dealt with some of those kind of sellers. They, they bulldog their approach. They wear people down and, you know, they, they sell and they're, they're quality sellers. The problem is their approach is not going to work with a seller who is a relationship builder. Right. You know, I, I would work with some sellers and they'd say, I, I can't take my manager in with me. They, they upset my clients. They're, they're, I, 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 I feel so bad. I have to go back to my client and apologize because I brought you know, Mark <laughs> in to talk to my, my customers. Um, so having that different approach can be a real struggle, not only for the sales rep who's reporting to that kind of a leader, but also for the leader. I, I think most sales leaders, they want to do a good job. You know, they, they want to help their team. They want to see their team grow. If they don't, they shouldn't be in leadership. But, yeah. you know, most of them, if they're in leadership, they want to do a good job. But they get really frustrated when they don't understand why someone is not performing the way that they did. You know, I, I worked with a gentleman recently, great seller. He had been in sales for, you know, 30 years. And our supervisor in that market retired. And this gentleman wanted to move into that role. He, he felt he was ready in his career. And over time, he ended up doing a good job with it. But in the beginning, he would call me and he'd be so frustrated. He'd like, I show, I rode with someone today. I show them how to do it. I go back a few days later. They're not doing any of the things I showed them. Yeah. And, and, and the things that he would do, they weren't doing. And, yeah. and it's, it's, you know, that can be difficult on both ends. And a lot just comes from people sitting down and, and trying to understand what made them successful and, and how can they make other people successful that maybe aren't like them. It's you hard know, to don't. get buy-in. It's hard to create that, especially when it comes to communication and people have different uh, communications styles. Um, Two things, one you brought up before in terms of communication style, feel felt found. One mm -hmm. of the challenges, and you nailed it, is if you use feel felt found, what that does is it appeals to a kinesthetic, someone whose sensory, lead sensory uh, access would be touching or feeling something tactile. And not so many people are tactile as a first line of sensory communication. And when I say that, I'm not saying that somebody who's tactile, you know, doesn't use anything else. It's like, are you left-handed or are you right-handed? If you are right-handed, it doesn't mean you don't use your left hand. It just means you have a preference. So I invite any of the listeners who are using Feel Felt Found to discover through techniques that we've talked about on the podcast on what channel your prospect receives and processes information most effectively and then deliver your information on that channel. So if you know that you have a visual, which you can tell pretty quickly just by asking, would you rather I gave you printed material or would you rather hear about what we offer? And once you get that, if they say, I want to hear about it, you go, well, feel felt found would be, you know, I heard the same thing uh, coming up. And until I listened to this person who told me X, I just, you know, the sound of it didn't make me happy. Now, that was obviously something I would not invite you to repeat in front of a prospect. But 
you you can get the idea and what you said is so right find out on what channel they're on and then deliver it that way and 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 that's a, a seller that understands that because what you're basically having them do is that that chameleon effect where they're going to sell based on how that particular client in front of them is wants to receive the information or it works into the sales leader then if you can teach and lead through what is going to work best with that individual, you're, you're going to be more successful. The challenge that I found throughout the years was those people that we look at as, quote, super salespeople, the ones who can go in there and they walk out and they go, I did it again, you know, cha-ching. Mm -hmm. People say, well, I want to sell like them. And you go and you ask that person to please candidly tell me exactly what you do to get those sales. And they go, you know, I don't know. I'm just good. Well, and it's so hard to be good on purpose that unless you have access to the language and the communication that mirrors what this person was really good is doing, you're just doing what you're doing with, different plugins. And that's really tough for a lot of people. What is the biggest challenge that you find in sales? Uh, you personally, I know we talked about the things that you've liked on one of our communications, but is there something that you looked at in the past and go, you know, that's the part of the sales process uh, I would change or get rid of? You mean just me personally? Yeah, um, just you personally. You're you're a perfect person to answer this question. Um, to me, it's it's the process part. You know, I, I enjoy the the interaction. I if, if you could line me up and I had seven presentations today, and that's the only part of the job I had to do, I would be ecstatic. Um, by the same token, if I love to cold call, so if you said to me today, Tom, here's our product and service, here's our ideal clientele you know, go talk to people and line up some prospects. Boy, I, I'm excited. Let me go do that. But to sit down and, and we need to do the little things. And this is this is a good point you bring up because a lot of sellers, they want to do what they like to do, what they feel comfortable doing. They don't want to do the parts of the job that they don't enjoy. <laughs> there you go. This um, is Susie. Susie? Yes, yeah, Susie. Susie right. is 14 weeks old. And Susie's got the wettest paws in the world. <laughs> well, she is going to be a master seller in about three or four more months. She's pretty she good right now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. You were, you were. She's going to be getting more treats from you and the neighbors than, than anybody. Cause she's going to know how to, how to sell that. Um, but you know, when you've got to do the parts of the job that you don't like as much, you know, I, to sit down, you know, I, I wanted to go in and really be prepared for each client. All right. Well, that takes time. You know, you've got to do some research. You know, I've got to maybe learn a little bit more about their industry. I've got to maybe read some things. So I have some things to bring up and, and talk to them about. That's not my favorite part, but boy, I had to do it anyway, you know, to be successful. May um, I offer a counterpart to that? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I have said for years that I don't want to know about someone's business and it's not because uh, um, it's not important. It's that it's, it's really not the most important thing to them. That what's important to them is moving from where they are to where they want to be. And even to the point where one of the exercises I do with clients is uh, when they first come on, I have them sell me their product their way. And then I sell them their product my way with no product knowledge. Where you need the product knowledge is in providing the solution. Because if you can truly uncover their problem and create an environment in which they trust and believe, that you can solve the problem, you had best be able to solve the problem. And that's where I believe the greatest amount of knowledge is necessary is in the follow through. So a lot of people who are coming at it from the other direction, there's nothing wrong with that. I just believe it's a longer road. So um, 
that's my two cents about that. We, we should do a show one day, Ike, where the two of us take six or seven topics that we can just sit and debate for an hour. And we'd probably have a lot of fun. Right? I would love that. On some we'll of those. That, put know, together a panel. I would, I would love that. There, there are certain things that, you know, and, and uh, but everything you said there, I agree with. You know, if, you, if you're really doing a good presentation, yeah, you're absolutely right. You don't need all those things. But then there are certain things, too, where, to me, it does help to know. I'll give you one example Please. that we used to have all the time. So um, our magazine was, was advertisements. It, it was beautiful ads. It was call to action, uh, photographs and headlines, um, coupons or things that would get people's businesses to phone to ring and things like that. And we did it in a, in a beautiful color magazine format we mailed out to people's homes. And there are a number of envelopes that we competed with. You probably have gotten some at home over the years. You open up an envelope and there's all these advertisements in there and coupons and things like that. So when I'm going in and let's say one of those accounts we wanted to get with our publication, there were certain things about us and those envelopes that were very similar. You know, we, we were both uh, direct mail we both would have a lot of coupons. We both would have a lot of restaurant ads in, in our product. Um, we both were mailing out to maybe the same towns, the same demographics. So there were certain things that were very similar. But then there were several things that could be very different in the way we approached it, the way we built the ads, the fact that we were a magazine and not an envelope. Well, here's what I learned over the years is, boy, I needed to know if I'm in front of Mary's Bakery today, and she has done one of those envelope ads, if I've been able to ascertain what she liked or whether she thought it worked for her, that would really help how I directed the conversation. Because if I start talking about how different we are and she loved that product, well, now I've, I've hurt myself. Yeah. But if I start talking with her, how similar we are, but let me, you know, we do this just, hey, I'm glad this works for you because we are so similar. But here, let me show you why I think maybe we're a little bit more. I go in that direction. If she had tried an envelope two or three times and got no results right out of the gate, I needed to distance myself or, or she wouldn't listen to anything I said if she started yeah. to think we were like them. So, so to me, that's the kind of stuff. It, it takes some time, but certain things, it does help to, to kind of just know going in. So I know kind of how to direct, mm -hmm. you know, where well, I'm going. Well, in episode four of the podcast, maybe five, called Before and After, I do a scenario where somebody uses, quote, the traditional way to sell and then uses the easier way to sell. And one of the questions that... Uh, the person having the conversation asked is, what did you like best about the way our competition handled your account? And get them to talk about that and then be able to say, and I know there may be nothing, but if there's one thing that you could change or make different or make better about the way your account is being handled, what would that be? And just be able to start to elicit that type of information, because something you said just a few moments ago, really, oh, I can't emphasize it enough. And I use this exercise a lot of a lot of the time. You're you love what you do. You're in a business that is highly competitive and you're really good at marketing and selling that business. You know who your major competition is. The bad news is you're fired. The good news is tomorrow you get to go to work for your competition. How much different would your presentation be? Now, you had different angles, but most people would go, you know, it really wouldn't be that different. So the question is, is how do you differentiate yourself? And I found that the best way to differentiate yourself is to forget about that and just talk about the problems you solve and see whether or not they need it. And it sounds so simple, and it's not. Um, but to me, that is a conversation that uh, blossoms in terms of the, your prospect's ability once they have faith that you're there to solve their problem and not yours. 
they start to tell you things that you never would have imagined, including what they like best and what they like least about their competition and what you would have, you know, what would I have to do to get your business away from me? And if they say nothing, you know, then, you know, you go back to the three by five card. <laughs> Absolutely. You always have that as your, as your, your, yeah, yeah. Would you please sign this and put your initials on it? I will see you next week. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, that leads to the, you know, we talked earlier about the presentations. Yeah. You know, there, there's your presentation. And then a lot of times you don't leave with the sale that day. So then it's, it's the follow up. You know, follow up is, is critical in, in sales because that's where you do a lot of your moving the sale along is, is what you do after that, that initial presentation. Well, in, in appointment-based sales, one of the things that I have found out that if you set up ground rules, that if you set up guidelines for the sale, which includes them telling you no with no problem involved with that because you'd rather get a real no sooner than later, you know, waiting for it is madness. And as you set up these rules or these guidelines that are agreed to by both parties, you actually say that if we get to a point and it turns out you have the budget, which we'll find out about in a second, you have the ability to make the decision and you actually can convince me that this is a good product for you, what will you do? And you set that stage and they go, well, if it really does that, I said, so let's move on that if we come to that point and if they ask you for a presentation, you go, I'll be happy to give you a presentation, but I have another favor to ask. And that's if after I give the presentation and share with you, you know, based on what you told me, how our product or service might be able to uh, resolve this issue that once we're done with that, you either say, no, thank you, or we move forward and do the paperwork. How willing are you to agree to that? You've got that agreement uh, up front, which is perfect. Just, just get that out of the way. And we weren't taught to do that because everything that you and I learned, I still do presentations. I still handle objections. I still do all of those. But the model says they don't need to be there as a matter of course but you still have to have the skills to be able to be flexible. You have to have the emotional intelligence to know when someone says no, do they really mean no? Because in most cases, a no is not a request for more information. Sometimes a no means no. And if you ask for that with clarification, I find that it's very refreshing and invigorating. I sound like a soda pop, uh, but that to me is so so important that you must have the foundational skills of selling and i want to acknowledge you for getting that information out to those who you've assisted up till now and those you'll assist in the future i have two questions first of all how can our listeners make contact with you that's the first question so if you'd please yeah, I, I would love to. And again, thank you for having me on today and letting me share with your listeners. I really appreciate it. Um, the easiest way to follow up with me is either in LinkedIn, uh, just at Thomas J. Bloomer. You can find me in LinkedIn. I put content out and, and I enjoy engaging with people there. Uh, and they can go to our website. Uh, our podcast website is okboomerteachmesales.com. Uh, okay. They can fill out information that. there. They can uh, they can see a variety of profiles of the people that contribute on the show, and and that's a great way to engage with us there as well. Okay, Boomer, teach me sales. I love it. That that really is. Uh, uh, you talk about a calling card. That that's beautiful. And in closing up our conversation, if there's one thing that you could share with the listeners of the Close the Deal Without Selling podcast that you think would be something that they might be able to use right away, or if not right away, that they can put into their quiver and bring out uh, when it's most appropriate. Uh, can you share something like that with us? Sure, I, I guess if, if there's one thing, I would say be creative, all right? I, I think a lot of times salespeople, they, they tend to forget some of the creativity and, and most salespeople have some creativity to them. So get creative, sit down and look at your clients 
and and come up with a creative way to to engage with them moving forward you know what can you do a little bit outside the norm to to grow that relationship strengthen that relationship look at the prospects that you're working on is there a creative way that you can re-engage with them what can you do um, I've, I've heard many different ways of doing it over the years. We could probably do an entire show on on how to creatively engage with people. But do you have one there. example that you can share? Um, yeah, one example right now would be to to sit down and put together a list of let's let's start with lost business, right? I I don't know exactly when this episode's airing, but let's say if it's early in 2021, we've gone through a pandemic. Um, we've all probably lost some clients for a whole variety of reasons that may be our fault, maybe not our fault. Um, what I would encourage people to do is to sit down and remember that if I had a client, there, there was a reason they bought for me that we formed this relationship. Um, just because it stopped doesn't mean that what initially got it going is gone. You know, either they saw our product or service as a solution or they saw me consultatively as someone who could help them with their problem, but there was something there or they would not have bought in the first place. So especially going through a year like 2020, there are so many things that may have popped up outside of either control. So many sellers, when you've lost a customer, you're, you're like, you know what, I'm not going back there for whatever reason, you, you think they don't like you anymore, you think there's something negative sit down and especially if they were a good you know if it's a good important client for you sit down and examine that why did they buy in the beginning mm -hmm. you know what potentially went wrong good and, and let's get creative on how do i rekindle that relationship how do i just jump start it a little bit um and and you know re-engage and and see if i can't get those embers yeah. uh, you know, catching a blaze again this year. My friend and fellow sales consultant, Alex Gilfain, uh, has uh, a great tip where he suggests that you go back to pretty much all of your clients and wish them the best because COVID is <clears throat> the great rapport builder. Uh, you know, find out how their family is. Uh, and he likes to end the call. By the way, I don't know if you knew that we also do X and he gets, says he gets so much business from that. And it's, I found myself starting to say that now because it just makes so much sense. So uh, I, I think that that goes in line with a creative way is uh, instead of going on oh, and lost them, what can you create to get them back? What a, what a great tip. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. It yeah, was this this was a bizarre and crazy last 10, 12 months. What has come out of it, and Thomas mentioned this earlier, is the ability to make contact with people we would never have met or created a relationship with. And I invite all of you to nurture those relationships and to build on those relationships. and. Hold off on selling until you've created those relationships in this virtual networking space, because then you too could have a conversation with a new buddy that goes just like this. Absolutely. It may not be taped, but you're still going to have a great conversation. So yes, and, and, and uh, you know, with, with all of the tools at our disposal now, if you really need to record it, I'm sure that you can. <laughs> On behalf of all of the listeners of the Close the Deal Without Selling podcast, and of course, from me personally, I want to say thank you so much for being on the podcast and enlightening our listeners. I know some of what you have said has made me go, oh yeah, which is all consultants can ask for. We can't teach people to do anything. All we can do is maybe cause them to think. And you've done just that. Thomas Bluber, thank you so much. It was fun. Thanks, Ike. <laughs>